Let's take a break right now from our coverage of the Anthony Pardon case in Ohio to discuss a cold case in Iowa where jury selection begins today. This is the case of Jerry Burns. He is now 66 years old and back when he was 25, authorities say he killed an 18 year old student, Marcel, Michelle rather, Martinko. 18 years old, she was a high school student, as I said, she was stabbed repeatedly in the face and the chest at least eight times. Her body discovered in a shopping mall in Cedar Rapids in December 1979. Robert Riley is a friend to that victim's family. He's been following the case very closely, and he joins us right now on the Law and Crime Network. Robert, good to have you with us this morning here on Law and Crime. What got you interested in following this case so closely? I was a young man. I was 12 years old when this happened in my community. My mother worked with her in a restaurant, so I knew her tangentially, but it was a shock. Uh, for something like this to happen in a small Midwestern city, uh, it was always something that puzzled me. And uh, 40 years later, about 35 years later, actually, uh, I decided to do more about it. I started a Facebook site that was dedicated to getting more clues to try to help solve this, this case. And ultimately, here's where authorities went with this. There was blood left on some of the victim's clothes and on the gear shift to her vehicle. She was driving her parents' vehicle. And uh, in 2006, they tested that for DNA. In 2018, they used new technology to process that DNA yet again. And presumably, through running it through some of these online genealogy databases, they ultimately started developing profiles of exactly uh, who may have done this. They narrowed things down racially. They narrowed things down uh, from an ethnicity standpoint and ultimately then they say they tested a straw that this particular defendant Jerry Burns disposed at a pizza place they grabbed the straw that discarded DNA theory they can take that they can run it and that's where they say they got a match and that's what leads us to the trial so from your perspective where you sit watching this all this time in Iowa um, is it a shock to you just exactly what got us to today uh, a shock? Uh, no, uh, especially with 2018 being the year of DNA. Once the Golden State Killer case was solved with the same exact uh, type of methodology, I was pretty confident that the local police would do the same thing here. They really worked that DNA hard. And so I thought it was just a matter of time, really, until a hit uh, came. Tell us about Michelle, the victim in this case. Well... You know, 18-year-old high school student, uh, loved by her friends, uh, seemed to have a, a bright future in store, going to go to Iowa State for interior decorating. And uh, this was truly senseless. Uh, no one can figure out who would have done such a thing. She had really no enemies to speak of. So uh, after 40 years, it's about time this, this girl who's forever 18 gets some justice. At one point, authorities thought that whoever perpetrated this crime must have been personal to the victim because of those stab wounds to the face. The more personal the wounds, usually the more personal the relationship between the victim and the defendant. Do you think that that theory is going to play out ultimately here, or does it look like this was literally just random? I don't think it's going to play out at all. No, I think uh, for sure it was random. Uh, the DNA really ruled out all the obvious suspects, the ones that the police had looked at over the years as the ones that they <laughs> thought fit the profile, uh, talking about ex-boyfriends or uh, people of interest, local acquaintances. It all been ruled out. So it had to be someone who was on the fringe or just a random killing. And this is what this seems to be. They have no link between Jerry Burns and Michelle. Is there any evidence whatsoever that this defendant, Jerry Burns, knew her? But you, you said there really wasn't much of a link. Is there any link whatsoever? No link whatsoever. Uh, and they've worked it hard. Uh, they've had a year since his arrest to try to make that link. And in the suppression hearings uh, in the last couple of weeks, that came out. Uh, both attorneys said, for the record, there was no link between her and Jerry Burns. So... I guess we'll only know if he'd talk, and I doubt that he will. You know, it's one of the most heinous sorts of killings we can imagine then. If it was completely random, it makes it all the more shocking. But 
Who could have imagined in 1979 that this DNA uh, technology would progress to the point where we actually can point to a particular defendant to the point of bringing that person to trial? So tell us about the defendant. I guess it was a shock there locally that he was arrested. Apparently he owns a couple of businesses. Uh, one of them is a powder coating business, I understand. One is a gas station. Uh, he's basically been living a, a normal life, uh, employing people and being a part of the community. Right. So that's a small town about uh, 40 minutes away from where the killing w took place. A little town called Manchester, a few thousand residents. So yes, he was living in plain sight, like you said, going on with his life. Uh, was known as a, a, a quiet but a likable local businessman. Uh, I think he had one speeding ticket in the last 40 years. So yes, no one saw in that community saw this coming for sure. And uh, he just doesn't seem to be the type of man that fits your profile of a, a violent killer. He also had some tragedy in his own life. Apparently, his wife took uh, her own life in 2008. He uh, also had a cousin who vanished. But apparently, authorities don't suspect any foul play related to this defendant in those two strange, uh, strange circumstances. Yes, well, the wife, uh, she did have cancer. The family members say that that was probably a contributing factor towards her suicide. With the cousin that disappeared, uh, it's strange it, that it's the cold case also. He disappeared on the exact anniversary of Michelle Martinko's killing. So that is fodder for the rumor mill. Uh, so while they're not saying that Burns is a person of interest in his cousin's missing uh, case, there's no evidence to say he wasn't either. So. Maybe time will tell with that. Yeah, that, it's just certainly strange. Now, the next question is whether evidence would come into this trial where jury selection is uh, beginning today as to that. My guess would be no. It's just too far afield from what we're talking about directly. So is this case going to rely almost exclusively on that DNA link that prosecutors will get up there and say only the killer would have left DNA on the gear shift knob and on the victim's clothes after having committed this stabbing? Well, from where I sit, and of course I'm not a lawyer, that is 100% the case. Uh, DNA is the star witness here. And it's a testing of the court system and the jury to see if that's convincing enough. I think this is only the second case so far to go to trial with this same methodology of getting uh, DNA using GED match, using Parabon Nano Labs, and coming up with a suspect but with no other motive or, or linking reason for that person to be here. You know, the they Talbot don't need to... Case in Washington State was solved this way earlier this year, and I think this is going to follow the same path. At the end of the day, why is his DNA at the murder scene? You know, generally, prosecutors don't need to prove motive or anything like that. It's helpful to have it because it can tell the story of intent, and, and if uh, that state requires it, premeditation. Some states just require uh, intent. Some also require premeditation on top of it. I, I know, uh, Robert, that you're in touch with the victim's family. Uh, I'm sure that they anticipate being called to the stand to testify about Michelle. Well, actually, uh, that isn't the case. Uh, her sister and brother-in-law... I uh, don't plan on being called. Uh, so I think uh, a number of her high school friends are going to testify uh, as soon as the, the trial starts. But um, I thought it was interesting that the, the attorney wasn't going to call them. I think what they're just trying to do is just provide a, a window into uh, who she was at the time of the killing. And maybe they think that her, uh, her close friends and boyfriend could uh, lay that out as maybe as well as John and Janelle. That's interesting. So uh, is the family following the case there in the courtroom then? Uh, how are they planning to take this all in? Yes, and that's nice. Uh, John and Janelle Stonebreaker, that's Michelle's sister and brother-in-law, uh, he practiced law actually in Davenport, the city where this trial is taking place. He was an attorney for about 30 years there. Uh, they came up from Florida and they're staying in for the duration of the trial and that they have many friends there that are supporting them as they uh, watch the events unfold. Robert Riley, appreciate you joining us on the Law and Crime Network. Certainly a case we'll be watching, Iowa versus Jerry Burns. Jury selection beginning today. We're waiting to see if opening statements take place as early as this afternoon or whether it will push uh, into the rest of the week. We will take a break right now on the Law and Crime Network. We'll bring you back to the Anthony Pardon case and the Christopher Hess case out of Texas when we return.